This bottom plate comes off with six ordinary Phillips screws and it does thread into plastic. So I'm not sure how many times you can unscrew and rescrew this in before the threads are ruined because plastic is pretty unforgiving when it comes to that. Make sure you don't cross thread when you put it back on or it will never hold. And uh, one of my minor peeves is that this grating is too large. Screws, for example, this size will fall right in. The board is completely uncoated, you can see through here, so it's not environmentally protected. And any small piece of metal that falls in is likely to destroy it or start a fire or whatnot. But this pulls right off. So here's the inside of the inverter. I'm going to give you a little bit of a close-up here. And this is the inside of the Cobra CPI 2575. And if you're familiar with inverters at all, you'll see that this is highly unusual. And I'm pretty skeptical about this particular mode of construction, but I'm going to reserve judgment until I actually test it out. What's so odd about it is that this case is plastic. Now normally you would have a row of fets and diodes and such over here, and a row of fets and diodes and such over here, heat seeking to this outer case. You'd then blow air through the case, and it would cool this. But this particular inverter, they did a very interesting cost-saving measure. They're able to cool the transistors much better than that, uh, much more efficiently, I should say, and use a lot less metal. This is aluminum here. Aluminum is expensive. Plastic is just about free. And this is the output stage for a 2,500 watt inverter. They just have four transistors, two on this side and two on this side. And that's pretty unusual. Normally you'd have eight. And I looked at the model numbers on these, and they're pretty typical of any transistor that you'll find. They are name brand, which is good. They're not some cheap uh, Asian-made no-name. Uh, so they are very good FETs, but there's only four of them, which is pretty interesting. They do have a green solder mask printed circuit board in here, which I like seeing. A lot of times you'll end up with a really cheap circuit board. Uh, so that's good. Here are the outlets. I don't know the quality of those yet. It looks like they're just all wired up in parallel, all by hand, as you'd expect. The only real automated assembly I see in here is on this board over here. And that board is the uh, circuit board that has a switch and LCD display and such on it. Looks like that had some automated assembly on it. But uh, it's pretty low quality, just like the rest. So far all acceptable though, really. Over here you have the input stage. There are two banks here on these aluminum heat sinks. And here you have your thermal protection on that one. And once again, I'm pretty skeptical. This mode, this method of construction definitely is more efficient in terms of silicon costs and aluminum costs. Here you have just these very small pieces of extruded aluminum and half as many transistors as you'd normally have in, this, in an inverter of this size. It also allows them to put it into a smaller case. This thing really isn't very big. And I'll show you a comparison of its size to some other common object in a moment here. So basically this inverter, you have your input power lugs over here, positive and negative. This happens to be the negative side. And you can see that there is a very large battery strap on that, nice and heavy. So you don't have to use both lugs in this inverter. Uh, that's just a matter of the connection resistance to keep the connection itself from overheating and the cabling. So you do need both of them populated to get the full output power, but there's nothing inside your inverter that's going to melt. It'll just complain about low voltage. Not a problem. So you have your main power coming in. It goes to these two banks of FETs, and you'll notice on this side, here's the two fans. So these fans over here blow directly through these extruded aluminum heat sinks with the components bolted to them on both sides, and the air then blows over these two transformers. And all the power for these transformers comes through these dinky little wires. I'm pretty skeptical on that too. Those wires are not heavy enough. They really aren't. And this just doesn't look like a 2500 watt inverter. This looks like a 1500 watt inverter. If they really did manage to get 2500 watts out of this, I'll be somewhat impressed. The capacitors on here are decent capacitors, but they're nothing special and there's not enough of them. For the input capacitance, there's really only these. Two little ones over here, and a few more over here. It's very skimpy. So your input ripple voltage is going to be very, very high. They should have spent more money on that. But they skimped out, because, hey, what do you know? Components cost money, and if you don't put them in, then it doesn't cost money. And on the output side, once again, these capacitors really are not adequate for a 2500 watt inverter, but 
it's not all that surprising because this is a low cost point converter inverter now you can buy this whole thing for around one hundred dollars and it is really difficult to get an inverter to cost one hundred dollars and just because i don't like what i see in here doesn't mean that i think it's a bad product because of the price point this doesn't cost much and i think that's why it's one of the most popular inverters out there today because it's cheap and people like cheap So there it comes in here, flows right past the heat sinking on these over the transformers. And this one over here on the output stage does the same thing. They have a little fan over here, and it blows right over these four transistors. Now, the picture on the box doesn't show a fan on this side, which makes me pretty interested in how the older model did this before they upgraded it. Maybe they had trouble with the fans or the FETs overheating, so they added another fan. I'm not sure, but this is the model that I have. Now, this doesn't work. It's completely dead. You push the power button when it's connected up and nothing at all happens. It draws no current, nothing at all. And I don't notice any obviously burnt components on here, no matter where I look. So, I th and the outlets also are not shorted. That's another test that I normally do. But in this case, it's pretty obvious what the problem is. This wire is probably supposed to be connected to something, don't you think? It's just sitting here floating around. And that wire goes through this cable and goes up to the control panel. Now, I looked at this a little bit, and it looks like, for some reason, over here they have a connector that is X number of pins. Over here they have a connector that's X plus one number of pins. And that leaves this one extra. Now, I think this is supposed to be a ground or a negative connection. And if you look down in here, Right down here, it looks like there's a couple of little solder blobs where somebody hand soldered this on, poorly apparently, and it came loose. And I suspect that's why this inverter doesn't work. However, I don't really want to connect this up to the wrong place because I could destroy a whole bunch of stuff and end up having to throw this away. So, I need to figure out a way to figure out where this goes. Now, I could look online to see if anybody else has any pictures of what the inside of theirs looks like but I suspect that everybody's is going to be a little bit different because, like I mentioned, this doesn't even match the picture on the box. So, obviously other ones are constructed differently inside. So I need to figure out a way to know if this goes here or not. How to do that? So I have an inverter here, and I don't know where this wire goes. I have my guesses, but I'm not entirely confident. So, what does a sensible person do? They buy another broken inverter, right? So I'll take this inverter, remove the back cover. This is also a CPI 2575. This is not in as good of a shape, but hopefully I can fix this one as well. Uh, that's irrelevant for this video. I'm just talking about this one for the moment. So I'll take these screws out. I already removed the other four and take the back cover off. There we go, two identical inverters. They're identical, are they not? They are not identical. They're both CPI 2575s. They both come with the same manual. They look exactly the same, but they are completely different products. Completely different. Outside they look the same. On the end panels they look the same, but everything is different about them. Once you get into the internals, it is a complete redesign. It is not at all the same product. Even here you can see that they used a different manufacturer fan in this one versus this one, they're not at all the same. Once again, a sign of a poor quality product. So I have the two inverters side by side now. I have this connector in there with this wire. goes up through here to the circuit board. And let's see what the other one looks like. Well, it's completely different. I can't even use this inverter to see where that wire goes because it's not at all the same. Completely different connector here. The cabling going up to this board is completely different. Here it's just all hand soldered in, a bunch of solder blobs. Uh, the board itself is entirely different, no similarity at all to this one. It's a completely different board. Here you can see that they use these buses to get power to their transformers. Here they use wires to get power to the transformer. Over here you can see that the transformers are wound with flat ribbon cable. That's more expensive. Over here, they're round with round wire. Completely different transformer. 
I haven't looked at the FETs on this one yet, but at least the cooling to the FETs and the diodes and such seems to be about the same. Or does it? No, it doesn't. The diodes are completely different. Here's a bunch of diodes in this one, over here and over here. And this one uses a different configuration and different type of diode. You can see on this one that the printed circuit board is this single-sided circuit board. Um, very, very cheap. A lot of discrete components on it. They had to use this stand-up soldered in board over here to have some of the smarts. Otherwise, a lot of hand work in here. You can see over here that this was not cut properly. A bunch of jagged edges that can cut into your cables that run right by it. I'm not impressed. The capacitors are completely different on this one. Not at all the same as on this one. And one thing that's really interesting is that the fusing is completely different. They use the same number of fuses, but these are 40 amps. These are 35 amps. They're not even fused the same. I mean, what the heck is going on? Is this the same product? It is. The same product, made by Cobra, but entirely different. Here we have uh, what's essentially a single-sided printed circuit board, but there's traces on both sides, so I'll call it a dual-sided circuit board. 100% different. There's almost no similarity whatsoever between these. Even if you look at the gauge of the wire going to the outlets, even that's different. So, was this made in a completely different factory by completely different designers? Is one a cost reduction of the other? I don't know, but neither of them are the same, neither of them match the manual, and I'm not impressed. So, this inverter doesn't do me any good. I'm just going to set that aside. But, it does look like there's a similar number of conductors coming off of here, and it looks like there is a ground. So, I'm pretty sure that this goes to ground. So it is a little bit annoying having to pull out my soldered iron for just this one wire, but at the same time, I'm glad that it is just this one wire. I could have a whole bank of transistors on here blown out and have to replace them all. This sure is a lot easier than that. And there we have it. The wire is soldered back on. Hopefully better than it was from the factory. Now, I did buy this broken because I wanted a broken one so that I could get it cheap and repair it. The fact that this came loose does not necessarily mean that these products are poor quality, just for that fact anyway. I don't like how it's hand soldered on there because there's process control issues, and this one indeed did fail for that reason, but there's always going to be some manufacturing variabilities when it comes to inexpensive consumer electronics, so I'm going to let that specific item slide. 